my first information about gender was you're a girl so you've got to be careful and that was it i didn't get any more information about this how can i be careful careful about what and um, i got these informations before i even learned about sex so i learned being a woman means to be an endangered species which is not very empowering and so um, we get a lot of information about sexual gender roles, about genders. We also know how many genders there are in the narrative about sex. So there are only two genders, there are perpetrators and victims. And we do assign genders to them. We, we absolutely know perpetrators are male, victims are female. And I want to find out why that is so, because it doesn't make sense. Because all the other gender differences have been deconstructed during my lifetime. All this, oh, girls can't do maths. Obviously, we can. Oh, boys can't draw well. We can't parallel park. Yes, I can parallel park incredibly well. Let me parallel park every car you like. So, um, and when I was writing my book, even the myth of the male and female brain, uh, the University of Tel Aviv in Israel, they found out it is a myth. We all seem to have human brains. <laughs> surprise, surprise. So it would be... Um, shocking if the real, the last gender difference were that one gender rapes and the other is being raped. That can't be true. I started out being a feminist and that was one of the main themes. So I went to all the no means no demonstrations and all that. And I was thinking about healing a lot because all the people that came to us at university and they talked about their experiences and we couldn't help them. We, we didn't have any kind of concept. So how, what can you do about, apart from going to therapy and then the idea in the 90s was you go to therapy and then first of all you disintegrate completely. So rape was a complete breakdown of the self. That was what we learned. And I thought, that is so damaging in itself. This is the only story you get. And I didn't want to, to tell these people who came to me for help to tell this, this story. I wanted to say, no, there are different options. And what could they be? And I talked to a lot of the rape crisis centers in Germany, and, and they said that was the first thing they talked about. It can be very traumatic. That might be the case, but it doesn't have to be. And you are allowed to heal because some people even have the feeling it was a kind of betrayal. So if they healed, it meant it wasn't so bad and they wanted to kind of preserve their trauma as a sign that something really had happened to them which I absolutely understand but so you have to have the permission in a way to to heal I come from Germany and in Germany the term survivor usually means survivors of the Holocaust so we tend not to use it some feminists do use it and I remember in the 90s when the term survivor came up I loved it because it was active and victim was passive and survivor was um, we are surviving actively brilliant and then I started to become kind of wary about it because it also linked rape to death and it can be very similar but it doesn't need to be. And it tells you, oh, it's a crime worse than death. That is basically the Victorian saying. Um, this idea of um, it's, a, it's a death of the soul and afterwards your old self will be gone, which is a very nasty thing to say. It can happen to you any time and then you're dead inside. And this can happen, obviously. Rape can have awful repercussions, but it can also be... I've met loads of people who came to me and talked to me and they, they said they felt guilty because they didn't feel dead inside. And that can't be the case. So um, if people want to be called survivors, Absolutely, I will call them that. But um, lots of people are trying different words. So there is the idea of situational victim. So you are a victim, but you won't stay a victim for the rest of your life. If I'm a victim of a car crash, I won't be a victim for the rest of my life. The word victim in Germany is a different word because um, it actually means sacrifice. That would be the, the literal translation. And we had this word after the Second World War because we wanted to ex um, to basically say that victims of the Holocaust and victims of rape, they were not guilty in any way of the crime that had been done to them. So it meant innocent victim, it was the Lamb of God, that was the sacrifice. So, and um, I, absolutely, I absolutely believe that even evil people shouldn't be raped. So you don't have to be this snow white lamb. Um, to be a real victim, to be recognized by law. And that's the other thing. The law only recognizes what we, what we know to be real. So we look for the real victims. And there's loads of studies that people who don't display enough pain, for example, that they are not believed as such. 
I mean, it is interesting anyway, who do we believe? Who? What's our idea of a real victim? It's quite a racial concept, a racist concept. So um, the, usually the victim is white and, and that comes from the idea that in um, prehistory that all people were fucking around. And so civilization, um, the libido of civilized women that went away. So um, the frigid white woman was to be the most desirable woman. She was the only woman who could be raped. So black and colonialized women couldn't be raped because they were up to it anyway all the time. Um, fat women are not believed when they go to the police, when they report a crime um, to an absolute incredible extent. And there's this idea, who would want to rape you anyway? Which is, hmm, Okay, and you've really got to, to swallow sometimes when you, when you deal with that and, and you can look at all that. And also male victims have a very, very hard time and up until in Germany in 1997, you couldn't be a victim of rape if you were male and you changed that in England in 2003. So it's not that long ago and it's still very, very hard for us to imagine that. And I listened to um, Question Time the other night and they talked about rape and one guy in the, in the audience said, but men can be raped also and a very nice woman from Labour said yes it's so good that you raise this point and yes man can be raped as well and then she kept talking and she kept talking about a victim she and it was always and even though she absolutely agreed with them um, in our minds and our language it's so strong a victim can only be female. We do talk about male victims when we talk about um, sexual abuse of children um, because um, male children are kind of, you can, you can imagine them as being vulnerable in some way. And then there's prison rape, obviously. And what shocked me is you can't make jokes about rape, but you can make jokes about prison rape. There's even this board game, don't... Um, pick up the soap and, and, and really that, that you can't be serious yes it really exists so all these ideas about um then they get their just desserts and oh we should set, send all the pedophiles to prison and they can be raped no that's not funny because that doesn't help it doesn't solve anything and i do want to kind of um change society with this book it's kind of a missionary book <laughs> in a way um and the, the thing why we can talk about rape in prison is because the perpetrators are male as well and because they usually give their victims female names like punks which used to be um, female it used to mean a prostitute or a horse or or old women so they they get these female uh, monikers and and so they're made into social women so we can say yeah yeah so it, even the victims in in prison even when they're male they're made into social women so it doesn't change our perception that uh, victims really really are female it's a way of of patriarchy imposing itself and looking at this um the studies of and you always have to take studies with a pinch of salt or, or even a lot more than a pinch of salt, obviously, but um, this is the way science works. We try to have better studies and better studies. And all the studies say um, that the more authoritarian uh, an environment um, and the less consent is um, in any way you know, registered in it, um, the more rapes there will be, and also the more kind of other um, transgressions of borders. So. Um, a prison or uh, the military and we should really really look at the military M loads and loads of rapes occur in the military as soon as that military enters a war um, I think it's three folds or, or even five it's um, five times as high so um, we do know if we stop going to war if we, it even if he got rid of our military there would be loads less rapes but we don't talk about that <laughs> That's not in any way on the agenda at the moment when I grew up with no means no, I always felt slightly uncomfortable with it because that was the way my parents talked to me, no means no, and if you say another word you have to go to bed without dinner or whatever. And uh, so when I found out that no didn't used to mean no in the 19th century when um, basically when the, the social sciences started, so, so sexology started, um, <clears throat> they had this idea of um, the active male sex drive and the passive female sex drive so um, the woman didn't have her own libido and that also harks back to this idea that in prehistory yeah maybe they did have but then the civilized women didn't have so 
um, saying no basically meant I'm a woman or I'm a white woman. And, um, and I think it was Havelock Ellis who said, oh, if um, women wouldn't say no, then all the world would be a brothel because this is um, normal for her. She is abhorred by the idea of sex and the man has to overpower her in an act that kind of resembles rape. And then she suddenly realizes, oh, this is actually quite nice. But she doesn't, she doesn't have this in herself. And um, all the sexologists also hark back to prehistory and they say, yeah, in prehistory, women chose from the suitors that overpowered her, the one who could overpower her best because he was the strongest and he could also hunt a sable-toothed tiger, which doesn't exist either, that was they didn't get the bones right there. So, um, so they had this idea that it was always like this and, and so he can't change it, obviously. And, and if I read any kind of um, self-help book about dating, they tell me, oh, if a man um, ask you for your telephone number, you should be a bit coy and don't give it to him immediately. And if he calls it the three day rule, you have to wait for three days before you call back else. He will think you're too keen on it because obviously men only want to fuck women who don't want to fuck them, which doesn't make sense at all. So um, if I got a self-help book for, I don't know, getting a job and they told me, oh, don't write an application. And if they invite you in for an interview, don't be on time else. They think you're too keen on the job and you'll apply yourself too much. They won't want that. And, and obviously not. And all this idea of, of passivity um, and, and women haven't got any, any, any own sex life. They don't know what they want on their own. We would not we wouldn't, we wouldn't go along with that in any other case, but as soon as it's about rape, we all agree, yeah, that's the way it is and that's the way it's always has been. So male sexuality is dangerous and aggressive, but active, and female sexuality doesn't come into the picture. And even when we talk about Me Too, it's very seldom about what do we want, how do we want, it's always about what do we not want. And I think it is important, but having learned, um, I do a lot of um, workshops on consent and the first thing my students have to learn is finding out what they want themselves. Sometimes they know what they don't want but as soon as they know what they want themselves and if the, as soon as they know they have the right to talk about it, that doesn't mean the other person has to give it to them but they've got a right to talk about it, then they can say no as well. Then it's a lot easier and it's a lot easier for them to recognize other people's borders. So usually they come and say what do I have to not do and say oh you've got to find out what you want and then we do loads of, of <laughs> Um, role play stuff and they, oh no I can't do that I can't touch anyone I haven't touched anyone for months and they, but that's a problem we've got to touch each other and I'm talking to teachers a lot and they say oh no we're very good about sexual abuse so there's no abuse because we don't touch our students and that is awful we don't touch each other enough and if you don't touch each other in an environment that is safe we won't know a we, we do need so much touch that we will endure touch even if it's not good for us because we haven't got enough but also we won't know how to negotiate we won't even notice is this good or is this not good so it is a problem that at the moment out of the best intents we actually don't touch each other enough. I absolutely love consent, but I don't think we understand consent. So everybody say, oh, yeah, we have to have consent. And then you ask them, how do you define consent? And then it starts to get difficult. In Germany, we have no means no, so you have to have an explicit no. And you can't go over that. And um, you have yes means yes, which is kind of vague. And I do love that. It's a lovely sentence, yes means yes. And obviously, yeah, I want people who have enthusiastic sex, and that's brilliant. But um, we have all these yes means yes um, uh, workshops at the moment where people are told, oh, you've, a, you've got to ask all the time and if the other person isn't sure then don't do it because then all sex will be good sex because you'll only have the good sex. But I know if I'd only done what I was 100% sure of, I would have had so much less sex in my life and that would have been a pity and you've got to try things out. That doesn't mean you've got to walk over borders. but you. But um, we are not, um, we are porous beings, so we only experience our borders in contact. So we, d we don't know, this is me and this is what I want, what I don't want. We notice that once we are in contact with other people and if you're in um, isolation, in, in um, 
incarceration you don't you can't even touch things on a table very soon because you lose that ability you can't see the walls the walls are rippling you can't grab at things so you do need contact with other human beings to notice your own even your own physical walls so your own physical borders um, and even if I'd only had sex when I'd been sober when I was young, I would have had sex a lot later in life. And that was important too. That doesn't mean we all have to get drunk, but it just means it can help as well. And when I do talk about consent, I mean um, consent culture, which is um, opposed to um, compromise culture. So in our culture, we say, oh, we make a compromise, everybody loses something. So and then we meet in the middle. If I want sex and you don't want sex, we meet in the middle, we have a little bit of sex, that really won't make us very happy. So the idea of consent is that we both say really clearly what we want and we are sure there will be a third thing that we're both very happy with. So um, first of all, that means we have to verbally find out what do we want and you have to we have to specify that which is really hard for my students and which is really hard for myself that's the hardest bit in it and usually once you can do that and you can look at the other people's wishes without having to give it to them that's the other thing very often we don't want to hear anybody ask us because we can't say no at all we have to give it to them or if you don't do that then at least we have to give them the next question which is no that's not the case this is just information and um and once we find something that we, are, we, we like to give, that will be a lot better for the other person as well. Because if, if you had sex with me without wanting it, that would be the worst thing you could do to me, obviously. And um, because we, we say that the people who give up the most in a compromise culture, they're the best. And the ones who, who um, say very clearly what they want, they're the egotistical ones, they're the nasty ones. But um, my mother is a lovely person, but she, she's one of these people who always gave up a lot. And it's not easy to live with these people because after a while you will have a kind of balance anyway. So um, if people give up too much for you, if they're a martyr for you, you will pay for it in another way because it, it can't work otherwise. So you do need people to be clear and you have to empower them to be clear about that. And that's the other thing. We go into society and we tell them, yeah, you should have just said what you wanted. Um, first, teaching them all their life, don't make a fuss, oh, don't be so difficult. And then suddenly they have to communicate clearly and that is not very fair. So we do have a responsibility as a society to enable people to feel okay with their own needs and not to have the thing they have to give other people everything they want. And, and that should be quite easy. That should be the easy part about it. We also have to change. Well, we have to look at, at the economy. If people really earn not enough money for a living, they will be abused a lot more. And we can't just look at rape and say, yeah, we all have to go into a consent workshop and everything will be all right. Um, the more equal a society is, and that means gender-wise, but also on many, many other levels, the less rapes there will be as well. We all know that. Being able to say what you want is very gendered, but um, <laughs> I have loads of, of women in my workshops and when you ask them, what do you want to take from someone? It's really like they don't even understand the question. And I mean, by take, how do you want to touch someone so it's nice for you? Oh, I want to give you a massage. No, no, how do you want to touch someone so it's nice for you? And it is really, that is mainly what we are working on. And yes, that is, that is very gendered. Even though there are more boys, young men, who have similar experiences. But it's also um, saying no is a lot harder for men. Just finding, and that is interesting because I didn't expect that. Because they, they've grown up learning, they always want sex. That's what they've been told. So if they don't want it, something must be wrong with them. And, and they, they really have an even greater problem noticing their no and, and feeling okay with it in some way. And um, feminism has done a lot for them to at least recognize that there should be, uh, they should be allowed to say no. Um, it is not always, it's not always a clear cut, obviously with gender, but yeah, there are certain problems that I encounter with my male students that I didn't expect and that are incredibly hard and I didn't think they would have so many problems. But on the other hand, um, because they always have to make the first step, so they, they've got, always got to ask. And this is only heterosexual relationships. 
obviously in, in lesbian relationships you have to make somebody has to make the first step or nothing is going to happen but for example i've never been rejected not because i'm so um wonderful because i've never made the first step so i never had to make that experience but i've, I've also never applied for a job so I always all my jobs have got kind of because somebody told me and somebody asked me and I have this theory that by being rejected sexually, you, you learn, yeah, that doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means somebody doesn't want you in this moment, in this certain aspect. And then you try the next and the next and you learn about, okay, you've got to try and you've got to offer. And um, I do think that does apply to the job market as well. And I, I talk to my students and I talk to my female students, um, have you... Uh, how, how do you think about, um, are you worth applying for that job? And very, very many of them say, oh no, I'm not good enough. I shouldn't apply for that job. And I think this is connected in a way. So it's unfair that men always have to make the first step and they're always the ones who can make the mistakes. So if, <laughs> if you ask, you can ask the wrong way. And um, even if you do role play and, and the, the women have to, to make the first step, it's real, oh, wow. And they don't notice that when, when people come to them and ask them and they don't do it perfectly, they don't notice it, it. It's not always because they want to be creepy because it's sometimes it's really difficult. <laughs> and, and it's really interesting to oh, that wasn't, that wasn't easy. And I came over quite, would you like to? And, and that, is so, that is so interesting. So it's also um, when, you, when you role play the other side, you can, you can get a lot of that. And you can also get a lot of power. So, I can choose you. I don't have to wait to be chosen. That's brilliant too. In the 70s, uh, all the books about rape, they had not thought about the myth of the black rapist. They just reproduced it. And when I was doing my research, I was kind of appalled by that. They should have seen that. And how can you reproduce that? Or just looking at police statistics. And I said, oh, so it's black men who rape. So obviously, because they were the ones sentenced for it and getting the longer sentences and all that. And, and obviously, we know by now that is a racist system. And then came uh, Sylvester, in, uh, then came New Year's Eve in Cologne. And, and suddenly, it all changed in Germany. All, everything went mad. So we suddenly had all this imagery that I only knew from, from the lynch murders, all these black arms touching white legs or touching white breasts and they were everywhere and it was all, oh it's the Muslims, it's the men from North America, they're coming here raping our women. And I was very shocked by it because I do loads of lectures and I talk and usually my audience is kind of left-wing feminist and suddenly I was asked wherever I went but but isn't it the case that it's mainly the Muslim men who rape? And, and we got to take that seriously. And, and I was standing there and trying to explain, wait, what, what are we basing this on? So if you read the newspaper, still, if there's a rape, they always tell us the, the, the well, presumed nationality. Very often they don't, don't even know the nationality. They always tell us, oh, it was an immigrant. But it, this, this doesn't mean that, if you read the newspapers, it is 80-90% of the rapes are by immigrants. But if you look at the statistics, it's not true. The newspapers don't report every rape, so they mainly report what is in their mind important. Um, after, after Cologne, there was an awful incident. A woman was raped and, and left in, in Freiburg and she died. And I was interviewed a lot about that at the same time. And she was raped by uh, a migrant, uh, by a refugee. And at the same time, uh, a white boy raped his 80-year-old neighbor and stabbed her to death. The both very, very big cases. So I always talked about both. And in the finished interview, it was always edited. And it was just the one case where the refugee had raped. That, and that was an awful case. And, and she was... Um, she was a volunteer worker for refugees and she was um and and it is it was shocking so but it it absolutely contorts the image so you suddenly think oh it's only them and we've got to do something and if you stop them from coming here but i looked at the media and even before cologne um, most of the right-wing propaganda was about rapes that sometimes, um, quite a lot of them hadn't even happened. Later on, they found out that they, had, that they were lies, that they were invented by the IFD um, to make it sound more dangerous. There's also this image of um, the country as being a woman and being invaded by this kind of p 
penis um, of of refugees and and entering her against her will illegally and all this um, and loads of laws wouldn't have been able to have been passed through if we, it hadn't been for oh there have been the sexual transgressions and a friend of mine um a colleague of mine from the radio, he went to the police and they had a hundred uh, hundred people looking at all the reports of New Year's Eve in Cologne. They looked through them for a year. I don't think any event has been as well documented, any crime as well documented. And what they found out was quite shocking. There were only 28 cases um, of rape, of technically rape, but not what people imagine when they hear rape. So it had been touching of genitals without permission, which is awful. Um, in a couple of cases, putting a finger in genitals, which is absolutely awful, but it's not thousands of unwanted penetration by the penis in front of the cathedral, which is what went through the media. So um, he published that and people really hated him for it. He, he got a shitstorm for it. So you're a liar and you want... And no, these are just the police statistics. He just went through the police statistics. But that means... It's not that different from an Oktoberfest, from a beer festival, where there are loads of rapes. And we all know that. We all know it's a problem. And we have to address it. And we don't, it doesn't mean, oh, it's no problem. It means we have to address it. But we can't say, this is different from everything else. And there's also a very famous feminist in Germany who I don't want to name. And she said, oh, this is the worst thing that has ever happened in Germany in her lifetime. But she was born in 1940 or 41. So that can't be the worst thing that has happened in her lifetime. And it, it, it's, it's not what she means, obviously. But, but everybody agrees on that, and that is so shocking. After New Year's Eve in Cologne, we passed a no means no law, which was incredibly important. And feminists have been fighting for it for a long, long time, for over a decade because um, we changed the law in 1997 so that um, perpetrators and victims were now gender neutral and um, similar acts to penetration could be rape as well. Before you had to be a man and you had to penetrate a woman you were not married to vaginally. That was the rape law in 1974. So um, that was a big step, 1997, and then they wanted to change it to, um, um, but also you still had to fight back to show there was a no. And then they wanted to change it to no means no, which was absolutely overdue and and kind of um, New Year's Eve kind of um, tipped the scales because up until then, yeah, we should, but let's wait and it's too early. But at the same time, they pushed in a couple of other laws. And one was that, um, what we call um, well, sexual harassment, so um, like groping and all this, which wasn't a sexual crime before. It was only kind of insult you could go for that. It became a sexual crime as well, albeit a, a very minor one. But then um, the CDU, the, the right-wing government, so basically the Tories in Germany, they said, OK, so if a refugee um, commits a sexual crime, like groping, they can be sent back. They can be wherever, to a war zone, which is unconstitutional, so you can't do that. But whenever somebody is um, sent back to Afghanistan, which we all know you, it's not safe to travel there, but obviously you can, uh, you can push people out and send them to Afghanistan. They say, oh, it's only the sex criminals that we are sending back there, which is really difficult. But then they introduced another law, which was even worse. Um, and I've talked to loads of lawyers and we still don't understand it. So um, this is about sexual assault um, by a group. So if you are a group, in, in a colloquial sense, just go out as a group, not in a legal sense. And somebody um, to commit a crime. So the crime could be, um, I don't know, smoking dope. Um, any crime, any minor crime. And one of you commits a sexual assault in any form. You don't have to see it. You don't even have to notice it. Then you are a perpetrator as well. You're culpable just in the same degree. And nobody thinks this will ever apply, but it has been passed. It's in our law now, and that is kind of frightening. And at the moment, the, the left is fighting for the Constitution, and we used to fight against the state, and it's so weird. So they say, no, please be constitutional. You can't do that. We, we want the rule of law, please. 
one of the reasons that rape is such a gendered crime has a lot to do with the concept of honor. So um, we have this idea that um, female honor was part of her body. So it was either <laughs> located in her hymen, which doesn't exist, but that's another <laughs> theme, or in her status as an honorable wife or widow. Um, men also had honor, but that was negotiated in the public sphere, so in the job or, or on the battlefield. And both could lose their honor. It could be stolen from them or they could lose it and then they lost their place in society. And when I went to school, we had to translate um, the rape of Lucrece. And I mean, you probably have to translate it as well because it's in Shakespeare, but we had to translate it from the Latin. Um, which was very good because nobody paid much attention because it was so boring and, and the story is incredible. So there is Lucrece, she is raped and afterwards she kills herself to regain her honour and that was a happy ending and we all went, <laughs> this is a great thing, so she's regained her honour, well done you. And obviously um, uh, there you can become suicidal and you have to take all that very seriously but the idea of the, the right thing to do after rape is to kill yourself, to basically get rid of yourself. We don't want you. You're defiled now. Please do it for us. This is awful. And it's also, it is a myth. And I went to, um, I did a lecture in Dresden in the, in the big hygiene museum. It's an amazing museum. And they had a statue of Lucrece. And, and it said, oh, it's a patrician woman from the year so and so. And it's a historical figure. And no, it's not a historical figure. She never lived. It's a mythological figure. And we don't know that. We forget that. And she really, whenever you, if you Google rape, the first images that come up are images of the death of Lucrece by one of Dura, Rembrandt, or any of them. All the big painters have painted her, either being raped or killing herself with the dagger. So, um, and, and I've known people who said, if I ever get raped, I'll kill myself. But at the beginning of Christianity, that became a problem because suicide was a mortal sin, obviously. So Augustine wrote a lot about Lucrece and mm, how can we deal with that? And he came to the conclusion, obviously, you're not allowed to kill yourself. So um, <coughs> it's best to die of a broken heart. <laughs> you should die anyway. So, so, um, and if you don't do that, you've got to remove yourself from, from society, either go to a convent or in any other way, show that really something has happened to you. So um, the amount of your honor is measured by your amount of pain. If my car gets stolen, I don't have to cry all day to show it's a really nice car. Um, but if I'm raped, I have to show that by the amount of pain. And Virginie Despont, for example, she was raped when she had been hitchhiking. She writes about that in King Kong Theory. And because she kept hitchhiking afterwards, people were really nasty to her. And they said, oh, then can't have been so bad, can it? No, it, it, it's a crime that happened to her. If I've got an accident with my car, I, people say, well done, you should go back behind the wheel as soon as possible. If you're raped, they would say, oh, stay at home, never go out ever again. So you, you're supposed to end your life. And it is absolutely right to respect if people say, I need this space, I need to, to heal, absolutely. But to basically pressurize people with the best intents and purposes. And I talked to the Rape Crisis Center um, in Germany, um, to many Rape Crisis Centers, and they said they have loads of cases where especially young women are sent to them by the mothers or, or best friends and, and they said, oh, I've been raped and, and my mother says, oh, I'm in denial because I'm not, um, I'm not traumatized enough. So what do I have to do? And they say, what an awful messenger say, well, it doesn't have to come up again. It, it might never come up. And if it comes up, you can come back here any time. But it's okay, whatever you choose, the way you choose. And if I've got any other, if anything else happens to me, the worst thing I could imagine is my partner dying. I would be allowed to find my own way with it. I would be allowed to be happy again. And that wouldn't mean I didn't love him. Absolutely, I don't, it won't happen. <laughs> Never. If you talk about it, it doesn't happen. But so basically, it is um, we allow people to have their individual way, but once it's about rape, it's like there's only one way for all of them, and we expect people to collapse. And that is a lot to do with because it was so hard for, um, to find, to, for it to be taken seriously. So it's not just locker room banter, it's not just um, boys will be boys, it, that, so, uh, to say no, it's a real crime, it has real repercussions and you've got to take it seriously and you've also got to get help, you, you, you've, you're entitled to get help. But that meant that um, now it became a diagnosis, so rape trauma became a diagnosis in 1980. 
But that also meant that something that had been done to you from the outside suddenly became a diagnosis that you were ill, which is also unfair, but you needed that diagnosis to be entitled to therapy, for example. So it's all very intricate. And that is the reason, for example, so that um, in, in rape cases, you also looked at the sexual history of usually the woman who was a complainant, because if you'd lost your honor before, then there was nothing to lose, was there? Or there was a reason why sex workers couldn't, for a long time in history, couldn't report rapes because they didn't have an honor. Why black women or, or, or colonialized women couldn't do that because they, they weren't honorable anyway. And why men couldn't do that because they didn't have anything to lose. Yeah, well, they should have enjoyed it. They're always, they're always up for it, aren't they? And loads of men have talked to me afterwards, um, loads, of, loads of people have talked to me, but also loads of men, and they, they told me one had been raped by his mother's friend, uh, a woman, in her 30s when he had been 14 or 15. And um, he finally told a friend, and they said, oh great, you had sex with a ripe women, woman, so that, well, that was brilliant. And don't brag so much. And, and that was really, really hard for him. That made it really hard for him to heal. And, and so we can all basically, we can break out of this constraint of honor, but it's also that we can allow them to, to talk about their vulnerabilities. It's lovely because I love me too, because the first time that my name has ever been <laughs> in the open spaces. So nobody's ever said me too in Germany. So and suddenly everybody's saying me too, me too, me too. And I'm interviewed all the time because who could be asked about that? Ah, I've got an idea. So um, I, I absolutely think it's an incredibly important movement. But um, the thing is that we reproduce all these old narratives. When we talk about something, especially when we talk about things that haven't been talked about a lot, we do tend to use narratives that are there because we need to be understood. So we reproduce these old narratives and we don't question them at the same time. And especially if it's loads of people doing, you usually end up at the lowest common denominator. There are loads of incredibly important Me Too stories. But if you just hear the mainstream media, it's these women who don't want sex and then the evil media producers come and pressurize them, which is obviously wrong, absolutely wrong. But suddenly um, we get stories that sound so kind of um, cliched and because they are the easiest to reproduce. So everybody quotes those and not the others, obviously. And so um, what I do love about Me Too is because it's been going on for so long, we have time to talk about it with more depth. And we can't have a debate via Twitter or, or via, even via Facebook. It's incredible. Social media is very good to um, get attention. I absolutely love that. And it goes quick, it goes fast, and you don't need the official channels. But that's mainly all it can do. And then we've got to look at it really closely. And our brains are so cooperative. So um, there's this study where women were supposed to do a math test, but once it was um, asked, uh, that it was called, this is a math test, and um, there's a control group, they were told, oh, you're women and you're so incredibly good at being empathetic and you're so multitasking, could you do this math test? Same questions, and um, surprise, surprise, the one group that weren't addressed as women, they felt a lot better, a lot better. They did a very similar test with, because the brain is so friendly and it knows, oh yes, um, I'm a woman, I can't do this. We all have this sexist knowledge. It's there in our brain, we can activate it or we can deactivate it. There was a similar test for men at, um, and once it was called an empathy test, same questions, and once it was called a leadership test. Surprise, surprise, the leadership test, same questions, men suddenly were absolutely able to be empathetic and to know what their employees would be thinking. They can do that, absolutely. But if it's called an empathy test, they know, I'm a man, I'm a plank of wood, I can't do this. Um, so because the brain will deliver that, if we keep repeating, oh, women are always victims, they can't do anything, and we do that because we say, whatever happens to you, it's not your fault, obviously. And it's not your fault. But I know in Germany we had the brilliant female uh, feminist self-defense courses and um, they cut funding at a certain point because they said, yeah, but isn't that anti-feminist? Because isn't that victim blaming and telling them, oh, you should have defended yourself? No, it's empowerment. But, um, and, and I do understand that thought and, and it is difficult and it can be misused. 
But if you don't empower people, if you don't talk about that, if you say yes, and what I'm really frightened about is that the debate, especially in America, is about how can we save women from sexuality. And I don't want to be, A, I don't want to be safe from sexuality. I want sexual self-determination, and that is something else. And a lot of this goes on to uh, detracting anything that could be awful. We take it away and you'll be absolutely happy when you're sitting alone in your room. And I've got, I had students, because it was all about the workplace, I had students who said, oh, I'm really afraid, afraid of applying for a job. It could be so dangerous. And they suddenly had the feeling, oh, um, the open spaces are so dangerous. We all know, no, 80 to 90 percent of rapes happen in the home anyway so don't worry go out have a job it will be fine um, and it's also it's also about um, some of the cases I sometimes think yeah it's a kind of how shall I put it it's a kind of scapegoat discourse because so much goes wrong so if you go really hard on a few people then it looks like we're stamping out rape and so if you if you send Harvey Weinstein into prison for 10 times life sentence so and then ev the world will be fine no that won't change anything and and I'm, I'm sure yeah yeah obviously he has to go to prison and we can talk about that but um, we should also talk about prevention we should also talk about ha social change and that's a lot more important and at the moment the discourse is a lot about higher sentences and we know from all the studies higher sentences won't prevent rape what they will prevent is people reporting if the sentence is too high if you think oh somebody is going to send, be sent to the electric chair you won't report rape or it will be a lot harder for you you know all about that so we should address that as well and all the feminist scholars say it should be adequate the, the, the sentence should be adequate to the, the crime. So if it's just, oh yeah, say sorry and then everything will be all right, then it's not adequate. But if it's too high, people won't record, report either. So we've got to address that. And um, we do go for easy answers, especially we want to be seen to have done something. And all the answers basically point to We've got to change our perception of gender. If you go for, oh, the genders are so incredibly different, so they can't really communicate, they can't really understand each other. How are they supposed to understand each other in bed? And there are studies um, that um, people who believe in gender, gender stereotypes a lot, they also believe in rape myths. So she really wanted it. And the interesting thing about this is this study has only been done with men. So even the people studying it, we're gender blind. It is incredibly, we overestimate our ability to treat people the same way. And we also got to reflect that. And one of the things that's incredibly important for me is I always talk about why it's so important to see vulnerability in men. And people say, oh, why do you always have to talk about men? And I think it is because um, we do know the only thing that really helps if people are able to feel empathy. But you can only feel empathy for other people if you're allowed to feel empathy for yourself. But we teach boys to man up, boys will, I don't know, boys don't cry, all this. So if you teach them they're not allowed to have empathy for themselves, they are unable to have empathy for somebody else. They are able to for a while, and, and after a while they really get pissed off. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. So it is incredibly important for all genders if also men are allowed to, to deal with their own vulnerability and if we as society don't, don't shame them for that. And there was a big advertisement in Germany for the man flu and they made fun of the man, ha ha, and now it's a man flu, it only affects men and now they have got to go to the cellar to wine. Do you want any cheese with your wine? And that's awful. We know men die five years earlier than women because they don't go to the doctor, they don't ask for help and we can't want men to die. Obviously we don't want that and they didn't want that. But because we have this idea when men break with gender roles, we can't deal with that at all. We have women breaking with gender roles, we have experience with that for the last 50 years and, and it's also it is difficult and we have to fight for it but it's also seen as heroic so to speak. They, they, um, they can be as good as men, that's positive. But if men want to be as, as empathetic or as human as women, they are punished for that. And that is bad for all of us. Our statistics are always incredibly interesting. Basically, we can only find out in statistics what we can already see. For a long, long time, it was, if it was about rape or assault, men weren't even included in statistics. Up until the 70s, men weren't even asked. 
So um, that is one of the big problems. Um, in America, most of the big surveys um, who are done by the Centers for Disease Control, they're only done on households. So yeah, if you exclude the homeless, and we absolutely know that they, they have massive problems with that's transgression on all kinds of levels. If you include, and they also include, exclude the military, they also exclude um, prisons and loads and loads of rapes take place there and a lot of the victims are male. So they don't even figure into the, in the statistics. But what was really interesting about that one statistic and like I said, statistics are always difficult anyway. So. Um, and for the first time in 2012, they asked, um, A, have you ever been penetrated against your will? But they also asked, have you ever been made to penetrate somebody else against your will? And suddenly the figures were nearly 50-50. And that was so shocking. And um, loads of feminists did meta studies of that and said, yeah, it, the, these studies are valid and we've got to address that. And because they couldn't believe it, not because they didn't want to believe it, but because it went against everything and feminists had to do it. So if a man had done that, <laughs> it would have just been a crazy men's rights activist. So you had to look at it as a feminist and address that as a feminist. And I don't want to say it's the same crime. And I, I, can't, yeah, I can't compare one rape to another there anyway. So I don't know, uh, I don't want to say, oh, it's 50-50 and so, but I do want to say that our idea of um, men rape women and they, because they enjoy power, um, is the wrong analysis. There are cases, especially um, if it's about sexual torture in prisons, you do know that that has got a lot to do with, with power, um, but they are not the norm. Usually if we talk about rapes, there's a lot at play here. And we also should look at um, how rapes are um, trans, transgenerational, for example. So people who have been raped or sexually abused um, tend to become either victims again or perpetrators. So, um, uh, if we want, if we just tell people, "Oh, you've done a, an awful crime," now, now stand in the corner and be really ashamed, that won't change the system. It doesn't mean, "Oh, the poor perpetrators," and we've got to cry for them all the time. But it does mean, if we want to change the system, we've also got to look at ways of really healing here, and we've got to look at helps help a lot earlier on. And that's the other thing. If people, especially with just with violence, just with domestic violence, if they say, oh, I need help to stop, it's really difficult for them because, and some friends of mine um, are working as therapists and they are working with perpetrators and rapists as well as victims. Not, not at the same time, obviously, but um, um, perpetrators can come to them or they go to prisons and work with them. And it's really hard and they get a lot of flack for that. But we know that, yeah, these people will come out of prison eventually and we don't want them to re-offend. And, and we, we should change the system so by giving them help we all were also um, save a lot of other people being raped. But it's so difficult because we dehumanise perpetrators so much we can't look at that at all. And it's so easy to say, oh, it's just the, the evil people who rape. And, and, and obviously you have a responsibility for what you do, but you also have a responsibility as a society. And you can say there are different societies where there are more rapes and there are societies where there are less rapes. And we've got to address those. So we, that means we can change something.